Hello, everyone. Welcome to Showing Trajectory, Los Scholars. I am Anthony Ramirez. I'm a third year doctoral student from the Department of Communication here at Texas A&M University. I'll be your host and moderator for today's event. Showing Trajectory is a, lad, uh, is a lecture series initiative to highlight the professional success of individuals and the journey they are taking to reach their goals. Today, we have two amazing guests. And before I introduce them, I wanna first thank our sponsors, the Department of Communication, Media Rise, the Latinx Studies Working Group, and the Melbourne G. Glasscock Center for Humanities Research. So thank you all for helping uh, support this event. So today for our lecture series, as I mentioned, we have some fantastic guests. Our first guest is Denise Meda Calderon, and our second guest is Dr. Roberto Avamir. So our first guest, Dr. Denise, uh, our first guest, Denise Meda Calderon, is a soon to be doctor, soon to be doctor. She is a fourth year doctoral student from the Department of uh, Philosophy here at Texas A&M University. Her work engages philosophical traditions such as Latina, Latinx feminisms, Mexican philosophy, social and political philosophy, and epistemology to explore issues related to Latinx experiences with, within and across borders. So without further ado, Denise. Thank you, Anthony, and uh, thank you, everyone, all the sponsors that you've mentioned, especially, um, you know, the Latinx Studies Working Group, giving a little shout out there to Valentina, who's taking that on. And um, I want to share a PowerPoint, uh, and I'm actually going to pull that up for us, everyone, to see a little bit slow with this. You are talking with a philosopher right now. These are new things. Anthony and I even like spoke to discuss some of the um, <laughs> the PowerPoint tricks that communications folks are always getting into. Um, so if I, it, can you all still see the screen just fine here? Yeah, okay, cool, thank you. Um, so I kind of want to move through this presentation um, in a really personalized sense as you all are, are asking for, but I also wanna pull, like move back and forth a little bit with thinking about philosophy as a discipline, as a discipline in academia. And then also like, I as a proud woman, where do I fall into this? Or how do I change something? Or how, what sort of possibilities can arise? So, um, you know, this, this amazing opportunity with, with you all, um, you know, with the showing, trajectory lecture series has really inspired me to, to generate a really like nourishing reflection of the journey in academia thus far. You know, I'm in my fourth year in academia, uh, well, in, in, at Texas A&M, my fourth year, my doctoral program. So it was a nice break from where I've been and kind of just all of the like immersion in this deep scholarship to step back and pay attention to the steps that I've taken to get here. So I'm really appreciative of this, this series for evoking um, this ongoing self-reflective process. And as part of this process, um, you know, there'll be certain attention, like I'd, I'd like you all to pay certain attention to the philosophical possibilities that I think are, are enacted when we think about just simply meeting another Latinx scholar, right? So that's, that's gonna really um, push through my presentation. And with that said, you have here um, Movidas Filosóficas, a brief reflection. Now, to begin and to start from the beginning, so to speak, mm -hmm. I want to acknowledge my roots. And so what that means, of course, for most of us is just really starting with, oh, my parents. Uh, so my parents, originally from Mexico, are Spanish, well, or Spanish speaking immigrants that established a foundation in the US and by their forties, they created what came to be known as the Meta Girls. So this is um, me and my sisters and we are the Meta Girls, this kind of like super group that existed throughout El Sereno, which is like a small, mostly um, a, a small community in LA, mostly comprised of um, first generation Mexican American residents. And and you see, this is like one of my favorite photos of us. Um, I'm like getting red because it's just like hilarious to think about all of the moments and, and just like the flush of emotions that pass, that pass by and resurface here. But 
Um, as you can see, there are six of us. I am the youngest of six. So we have, um, you know, Laura, which is the one choking me, <laughs> Judy, who's choking in the on the far edge with the bangs. You have Sandy, who's being choked. You have Claudia, who's throwing up the west side sign. And then you have Jessica just smiling, like, very neatly in the corner there. So my sisters, <laughs> we were known in the community as the Meta Girls, and it was really cool. Like, everyone knew me as a Meta Girl. I had no other identity. Like, I wasn't Denise. I wasn't, like, this basketball player. I wasn't this student. Like, I was one of the Meta Girls. So... I think for some people that kind of like, oh, your identity gets lost, but that's how I really came to know myself. I really came to know myself in relation with and in a very empowering way, right? Because if you think about um, being in relation with, you're also thinking about how you exist with other people, right? My sisters are a really diverse bunch. Like some of them are accountants. Some of them run for work for the government. Some of them are like resellers and I'm like a philosopher. We, we have just really different approaches to how to do things. And you learn a lot by being in that kind of dynamic where you're sharing one bedroom among five women and like one bath bathroom in, among seven people, right? So, so there was like a really important sense of communality that will resurface throughout my academic career that is significant to how I'm understanding uh, myself in philosophy. So moving through the presentation, you'll see a couple strands. And I like the idea of strands as like the trenzas, right? The braids. Um, but with trenzas, there's movement, there's interlocking, there's, and then there's moments where the strands are kind of not yet crossed. And so I like this idea, this metaphor of the strands and um, thinking about trends in philosophy, who's doing philosophy, um, the, the movements and the possibilities that can arise in doing philosophy. And I do, like I mentioned, wanna give you a general sense of just the disciplinary, the discipline of philosophy, um, but also like how these interactions that are taking place that sometimes don't get captured if we're only looking at philosophy um, as this like really, unfortunately, sometimes, narrow discipline. So just giving you a feel of what philosophy is. <laughs> this is um, just a quick Google search of philosopher. Uh, it's really funny because, well, you might recognize some of these philosophers, right? You, you see Rene Descartes at the very bottom. Um, he, the Cartesian dualist, right? Mind body split, I think therefore I am. You have Immanuel Kant, the very bottom, uh, again, a, a philosopher who's a, a European-based philosopher whose approach is like based on rationality and universality, um, individualism, like these are key markers of what Google is showing us <laughs> in these images of what a philosopher is. Unfortunately, it's not too much different. So this is data that you can see. Um, tracking over the years 1988 to 2004. What I thought was really cool about starting with this is um, I was born in 1987. So this, this helps us kind of just even see in the past 30 years um, plus <laughs> that there, there's data that tells us philosophy is mostly male. And if we're gonna do this like fracturing and a separation of identities, it's mostly male and it's mostly white. So in 1988, you see here um, this, and where I, I really want us to, to bring our attention to as well is um, in 2014. So in this data, um, and this data actually indicates the changes of the racial and gender makeup across um, the four, of, at, at four year institutions across these years. And during this time, you'll see that it's referencing full-time faculty. Notice adjunct are not counted in this. Um, and that's important because a lot of adjunct often are, in many cases, the most vulnerable and those that very often don't have their PhD or can't find that job, right? So like there's all these tensions that come on when we're thinking about who's not included in this. But just to give you a, just a, a basic lay of the land, so to speak, I think this really helps us see where philosophy in the US Academy 
has been. And as I mentioned, 2004 being the last year here marked, that also helps set, set us up for where I kind of come in into what the academy um, comes to be in my experience. So I start off at the University of San Diego in 2005, and here are just like baby Denise pictures. Um, and you can see like I was in the philosophy club, I was uh, a participant at Encore, like I know a lot of us probably have been to Encore and like uh, have, have been a benefited from some of the amazing discussions that take place there. Um, I started at the University of San Diego in 2005. I finished in 2009. And during that time, um, as I mentioned, when I was in all of these, these organizations, I also was a part of the Educational Opportunity Program. So EOP, I'm also, I was also an active member of ACHA, the Association for Chicana Activists and Mecha, the Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Aztlán. Um, these programs were also really helpful for me to navigate what it meant to be. Um, I, I learned like more, more explicitly there, but like Latina at the time, Latina in academia. Because before that, when I was in Astorino, I was Mexican-American, like the rest of the folks, we didn't really even think twice about even the label Mexican-American. It wasn't something that, was ever really called into question or juxtaposed, juxtaposed even. So I came into a space where like, full disclosure, University of San Diego is also known as a, like University of Spoiled Daughters because it's a very wealthy university um, in Southern California that like liberal arts school. And again, here's, here's a really big juxtaposition of most of us in these photos, first generation college students figuring out like loan problems, figuring out how to be um, in these programs that in classrooms and classroom settings where we're not learning more than what we've learned in the past in terms of what traditions, right? The European Anglo traditions and ways that exclude um, Mexican, you know, Mexican American, Asian, Asian American, Black American in a lot of the discourse. So. In 2008, I, I had one of the most like pivotal moments of my academic career. Um, I became a McNair scholar. So for those who are unfamiliar with the program, McNair is a post-baccalaureate um, achievement program named after Robert McNair. He, he was a black scholar and, and astronaut. He was actually the, the second African-American man to go into space. So the, the McNair program uh, aimed at assisting first first generation college students or students from traditionally underrepresented um, social groups to enter into graduate school. So the McNair program identified that there was a lack of transition from students of first generation background or underrepresented backgrounds transitioning into graduate school. And it stepped in to assist students by providing not only resources on like financial, um, you know, support with like the GRE, um, you know, workshops and things like that, but they also were involved in helping set up a, a undergraduate student research conference. So I, in preparation for this conference, I was supposed to work with a mentor um, that is, was in philosophy. And I was supposed to prepare a project to present at, at, at Berkeley in that same summer of 2008. Um, that didn't really work out with, with the philosopher because when I was trying to work with her and explain where I was going, she, she pushed me towards white feminism. And she made very clear, and she was almost explicit, I think, about it to say, you can't start where you are. You have to start earlier. So you have to go to white feminism. And I didn't get it, right? Like, why, why do I have to start with white feminism to look at Latina feminists, right? Like why, why can't I start with Latina feminists? And her point essentially was, well, if you're talking about gender, you have to look at white women. Um, really perplexing, right? <laughs> now, me now, I have like the perfect response for her, but me then didn't understand. And I didn't understand how to tell my professor like, no, you're, you're getting it wrong. I don't wanna look at gender through this like lens that is not what I'm trying to promote or, in, or investigate. 
Um, so it didn't work out. She, she did not continue mentoring me, but I, I found a mentor um, in another professor. So she, this professor who I turned to, she was my professor for English and she was also an ethnic studies professor. And it was through her class, I actually learned about Gloria Anzaldúa. And it was through her class, I actually learned about Ana Castillo um, and so many other women of color scholars who were doing great work. And so I turned to her and I said, look, this is what I'm trying to do. And she was excited. Um, she, she wasn't familiar with too much work in philosophy that paid attention to Chicana feminism or Latina feminism by large. Uh, and, and so I didn't realize how like impactful that might have been, but what, what I learned now is there, there was a thread there that I was, there was a strand that I was working with. I was starting to um, think about this multiplicity that was not in philosophy. I was thinking about this concreteness, this lived experience, and those just were not in philosophy. Those were not tools of examination that philosophers at the time were even thinking were valuable. Um, I was often told, go to sociology, go to, that's ethnic studies, that's, that's not philosophy. So I did it as philosophy. I did it very early on as philosophy. I looked at critical race scholarship. I looked at critical race feminism. And through um, the assistance of my ethnic studies English professor, I produced this work that I was really proud of and that was well received at this university um, at, at Berkeley at the time. So just like a little interruption there, you know, it's funny, I actually saw that same professor who is in philosophy that did not want to work with me. Um, I saw her years, much like five, seven years later uh, when she was a speaker at a university I was teaching at. And so it was really interesting because I was like, look, I'm here, I'm here. And I'm going to be one of the, the people in your audience who's going to throw you a question. So that was really cool, like to just think how that popped out later in life. Um, but anyways, um, going back to McNair. So, so McNair was really helpful because uh, with McNair, I was able to um, think about this work that I'm telling you and also meet other philosophers who were doing work that I had never heard of. So. I met Carlos Sanchez. He is a Mexican American philosopher. Um, at the time when I met him, and this was in 2008, he had just received his doctorate two years before. He was one of three Mexican American PhDs in philosophy in the United States. So at the time, in 2008, only three Mexican American philosophers with PhDs existed. That's not that long ago. That's not that long ago. That's 12 years ago that we're talking about. So this was a really like profound moment to just realize there aren't that many of us. At the time I was super stoked. I'm like, I'm gonna be the fourth, I can't wait. You know, thankfully since these 12 years have passed, there have been several. So I am far from being the fourth. Um, I'm hoping I can even get in the like top 50, but I'll take that, right? Like the, because they're, they're such, amazing scholarship going on. But in 2008, it was only three. And at that time, there wasn't such a, a field in the US that was like gaining traction across the US as Latin American philosophy, as Mexican philosophy, even though there is, <laughs> even though there is. So, um, you know, at, at this time, um, I graduated, or, you know, 2009, fast forward a little bit, I graduated with uh, my degree in Spanish and English and philosophy and a ma minor in English. I took a year off after my, my program to join the AmeriCorps. So the AmeriCorps, if you're unfamiliar, it's kind of like the Peace Corps, but it's not international. It's here in the U.S. It's domestic um, public, public work. And so I worked with a charter high school called Youth Build, which is an alternative to a traditional four-year high school. And the reason that that, that um, job was important because I worked with youth that were pushed out of high school. And what that means is that for, for various reasons, they were not deemed worth saving sort of thing. Like at, and they were perceived as beyond redemption. It was a very unfortunate sort of type of reality that they were given. They were, and what I mean is um, the LAUSD is not one of the greatest districts in Los Angeles, in the country. <laughs> uh, 
And these students were being told they weren't good enough in high school. So, so I, I was helping um, to provide them an education where they were not being seen as inferior, as not be and not being seen as insufficient. So, I was a college center coordinator. We helped with um, promoting community college, which I wish I would have done in hindsight because I would have saved a lot more money and probably had amazing, amazing professors. Uh, but, but we really helped with that path. And while I was doing that, I was applying for graduate school. So I was applying to go into San Jose State where Carlos Sanchez was also the professor. I got to work with him. I took my first Latin American philosophy class. I find I, at the time, and I remember the book that we were reading, it was an anthology. It was one of the first anthologies on Latin American philosophy. So it was cool. It was cool to learn. Like these are works that are coming from Mexico, that are coming from Cuba, that are coming from um, Argentina, Argentine, or wait, Argentina. Ooh, got a little stuck there. Argentina and, and so many different countries that I never could have imagined because when I was trying to do some of this work, I was told it didn't exist. Um, an another thing that I was able to do while I was at San Jose is I started teaching and I fell in love with that. It was amazing. Um, I got to be in a classroom with students and work with them. Um, I, I, I fell in love with it. So from my master's program, I became aware that I can jump into teaching and I did, I did just that. When I was done with my program at San Jose State, I went on to serve as an adjunct faculty member at a few universities, uh, Mount St. Mary's University, Cal State Fullerton, Cal State Northridge. I also worked at a couple community colleges and um, private schools, but I, I really want to pay attention, like bring attention to Mount St. Mary's University. Because Mount St. Mary's University for me was a very like formulative uh, experience. I really, I think, came to immerse myself in what it would possibly mean to be a professor and work with, at the time, mostly um, in at Mount St. Mary's, they're mostly first generation Latina students. So <laughs> at Mount St. Mary's, I, I learned how to do teaching often under the radar. So if, if any of you all know, sometimes um, your departments have a, have a very attentive eye to what you're teaching. Uh, they, they, they look at your syllabus, they approve every detail, and if it's not something that they want you teaching, they will rip it up or mark it off, which I've had done to me. I've had, I, I put together this beautiful syllabus, I thought, that included so many brown black scholars, and I was told, no, this is not intro to philosophy. You can't do this. Basically, I needed to have more Plato, Socrates, Aristotle in that. That's, that's just what I was kind of given. So I learned I had to fly under the radar. If I was going to give my students things that they deserved, knowledges, like access to these knowledges that mattered, I had to do it in a way where I couldn't really let my department know and I had to really trust my students. So that put me in a very vulnerable position as an adjunct faculty member where I had to trust that my students were going to be in it with me. And we we're going to really uncover, so to speak, these knowledges that we weren't able to do publicly. Um, you know, I, I remember having to like teach them articles that I would only could only assign as extra credit because I couldn't technically give them credit. That would be unfair if my if um, I wasn't able to put it on the syllabus. So I was like, okay, here's extra credit if you want it. And they were, they were so eager. They were amazing. Um, and so that was a super profound uh, teaching experience that, that, that happened. And I really can say that along with, with my teaching experience, you know, just working as a high school basketball coach really did a lot of, a lot for me to understand what it meant to do something in community work. Um, and kind of along the way, I, I found amazing organizations and philosophy that really helped prepare me for what we basically see with me uh, today. And this I wanted to show you very quickly is philosophy up until 2014. So I, uh, I told you I finished my master's in 2012 and I came to A&M in 2017. So this, this graph here is kind of just give you a little bit of a, an idea of what philosophy was looking like and then 
we can see how that's how that's going to shape some of my philosophical experience here because I'm at a and <laughs> So this is this is me here um, in a couple of pictures uh, at a couple of conferences I've attended while I've been here at a and One of these persons you might recognize is Gregory Papas. He's the person, um, if you're looking at the, the photo with the, the, the Mexico, the US-Mexico border wall behind. So you see that fence, the Mexico-US border. In that photo, um, you have Gregory Papas, who is a professor here at Texas A&M. He is my advisor. He's someone I've worked uh, very closely with in the past three, well, four years now that I've been here. And he's, he's been incredibly supportive and influential throughout. Um, he is one of two Latinx faculty members in the philosophy department. Um, so they're, him and that other professor are about two of 22. And I am one of two <laughs> Latinx scholars out of um, 26 or so graduate students. Uh, and that student just came in this year. So I was one for a while. And yeah, most of my classrooms, I was the one for a while. And in many of these classes, I was also dismissed and excluded from a lot of discussion. I've had professors blatantly disregard my commentary. Some just failed to engage me. <laughs> um, and often, I, I know, like I said, I'm the only, not only the only Latinx person in my class, but the only person of color in a lot of my classes in philosophy. So it's a very interesting and exhausting conundrum between this like hyper visible and hyper invisible experience um, that is centered on the body. And, you know, along with and, and beside this, I also had um, or have amazing and, and like beautiful experiences uh, inter in an interdisciplinary sense. So I, I am encouraged and I was like from the very beginning to go outside of philosophy, go outside of the department. I am so glad I have. <laughs> I have, um, because I've stepped out of the department, I'm learning in a more fruitful sense how to thrive in academia. I'm learning through other departments and engaging with history and sociology and communications and English and Hispanic studies, and just a lot of different places that are guiding how I'm understanding what it means to do philosophy proper. So, I, I think this is like perfect to kind of just turn to what I'm describing as at AM, this interdisciplinary sense of like pillars of Latinx community, because you know, I've 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 had the opportunity to work with Dr. Uh, Nancy Palenque Videla and Sonia Hernandez on the Mexican Reintegration Project. It's a project where we um, for the for three years are traveling also to Mexico to track how um, deportees are being um, supported or not upon de deportation. Uh, the Inter-American Journal of Philosophy, I work with Dr. Papas, it's an in-house, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's an in-house um, journal and in, in, in the philosophy department. And I've met some great scholars in that journal. I've had an opportunity to network with a lot of people outside of Texas A&M, other philosophers who are doing brilliant work. Uh, the Latinx Graduate Student Association, shout out to Anthony, Cynthia, a lot of great, great people that are doing work there and that are not only um, like as, let's say, so to speak, individuals doing great work, but as community, like really bringing numbers, really bring showing up and showing out and supporting one another, hosting workshops, hosting like the Latinx Studies Working Group, but hosting workshops, hosting meetings, socials, informative um you know series like these right and so this has really been a pillar of what i've understand what i've come to understand as latinx community especially at texas a m and so so with that said i think i you know i think it's like nice to, to end with with um Cesar chavez here but i think this is important when I'm thinking of interdisciplinary work and I'm thinking of thriving in philosophy and I'm thinking of navigating academia, a lot of that work has meant carving out spaces for our own brilliance. And, and this is like a brilliance that's so rich and complex and socially sustained and concretely worldly. Um, so, so 
all of these moments in my academic trajectory have really been philosophically insightful because I get to pay attention to some of the most generative dimensions, which include my interdisciplinary engagements, uh, which include how being in the classroom, opening the, the book to scholarship of these knowledges that have been suppressed uh, because of colonialism, because of capitalism, because of so many structures of hegemon hegemony that when I get to come into some of these spaces, I, while we can talk about the institution, being in these four walls, I, I get to engage with my students in ways that are really meaningful for them and for me. Um, so I really think about, you know, the community work, not just quote unquote outside of academia, but also inside of academia, thinking of the community that sustained with us, the community that stained in the classrooms with, um, when we really bring to the fore the, the types of philosophical possibilities that can arise when we're doing work that um, is not focused on sustaining hierarchies, not focused on sustaining domination. And, and I think that there's a lot of possibilities that I am interested in exploring even further when I'm in these spaces that are interdisciplinary, but also in these spaces where I'm with Latinx scholars who are doing really critical work and meaningful work. So I'm excited. Um, I, you know, Cesar Chavez really brings out like in this quote that there's there's a lot at stake. There's a lot at stake, not just for ourselves, but as we're thinking of ourselves with community. So I appreciate being a part of this because I understand that there's there's movement and I'm glad to be moving with you all. So thank you. Thank you so much for that, Denise. Um, we have a couple of questions and comments from Facebook. Um, so let me get to that really quick. Um, Dr. Srivi Ramasubramanian asks, um, do you have any insights on why philosophy as a discipline is so white? Um, I think, I think that's a very, very big question. I think that one thing we understand about academia is that in, in at some point, all areas, most areas of study were philosophy, right? They were all housed under philosophy and, um, it became incredibly significant at some point to divide them all and to establish very distinct methodologies. What philosophy has tried to sustain is this aspect of universality. Uh, philosophy in mainstream traditions. Let, let me clarify that. Uh, philosophy in mainstream traditions have I had tried to maintain this um, from, from the ivory tower type of inspection. So it's it's the philosopher that has to rise above all of these concrete lived you know, moments and provide a more profound analysis that can tell you the way it is across the world. And if, if you think of the ways in which that's traced historically, that is also connected to significant historical moments of conquest, of colonialization. Um, and I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a mistake. So what we're seeing right now with philosophy is, is this, push of, we have a lot of other people doing philosophy that's not analytic and that's not continental. They're doing Africana, they're doing Chicanx, they're doing Latinx philosophies. What do we call them? How do we put them under this category? And what that does is that it, it tries to homogenize them, right? And it tries to um, impose this, this logic of categorization in such a way that tries to blur any race the significant practices and different sets that don't, don't collaborate with uh, mainstream media, or I'm sorry, mainstream uh, philosophy. I guess that can kind of just translate in a lot of different places, but, but yeah, that, I think that's a great question. I think it's a very loaded one. I believe my answer is not a complete answer. Um, however, <laughs> for sake of time, and I'm sure that it'll unpack itself a bit more in our discussion. I'll keep it at that. <laughs> awesome. And then just a couple more comments uh, really quick for you, Denise. On Facebook, uh, Dr. Shrevi added, 
um, and I even added it here in the chat. I am so sorry that you had to under the radar to teach courses um, your way. Thank you for sharing this. Um, also, we have Sandra Meda say, thank you for sharing uh, many great points and experiences, Meda girl, proud <laughs> big sister. Also uh, on Facebook, we have Juan R. Palomino. He said, wow, Latinx philosophers, what a story. I would love to read such a story. So really cool to hear that. Um, uh, Joey would also, uh, Joey Lopez, Dr. Joey Lopez um, is uh, asking or saying um, how he likes how you shared the trajectory um, in a very real, not straightforward way, but still keeping, uh, um, but is one you still keep moving forward. That's what he says. So yeah, uh, uh, if I could just on that, on that comment, um, I, I've been working on my proposal. So fourth year proposal stage, trying to get, you know, the dissertation underway. And I was meeting with my advisor. I had this moment where I'm like, man, this is, this is tough. <laughs> you know, I'm figuring this out. And, and he reminded me like, Palante pa, pa como el elefante. Um, forward ahead like the elephant is the reference, is the translation, but the point is <laughs> the movement like the elephant, he says, it's slow, but it's powerful. Move like an elephant. I thought I thought about that. I, I, you know, and it it helps because I'm a slow mover. I process very, very slow. Um, but, and, and this is to Joey's um, comment, it's, it's not a process that I ever am thinking of a movement in an upward sense of this like mobility upward, but it's, it's very complex and navigating the, the back and the forth, right? Because a lot of that is helping me figure out how to move in this forward moving sense of, I'm still trying to make sure we have a Latinx philosophy that I can contribute to. Right. So, so to that point, yeah, it's definitely not all straightforward and it's never only um, in this linear sense, yeah. So a couple more things from Facebook. Uh, Dr. Shrevi wanted to say thank you for sharing your insights on uh, homogenization and university, universality. Um, that makes sense and that she really appreciates that. Um, a second question. Um, from Juan R. Palomino, he asks, what was the reaction of your family when you told them that you wanted to be a philosopher? <laughs> My mom still thinks I'm a psychologist. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see, what was their reaction? I don't think they thought anything about it. I don't, I'm not sure. They've never said anything, actually. <laughs> it's never come up as a topic of conversation. Um, I, I don't, I think being the youngest, whenever I go back home, it's never like, oh, here comes a doctora, right? It's like, I come back home and I'm into this dynamic again, and academia goes out the window. I'm not, yeah, I, but, but I will say this, I, I have told my mom, and this is very true. I learn so much, I'm getting my PhD just to be able to have conversations with her. And what I mean by that is she knows so much. She finished school, I think in like elementary school and then she came to the US. So she doesn't have that formal education that we talk about where like you need to go to university to be educated. Like that's not even something that is important. She reads so much. She reads a tremendous amount. And I, <laughs> I learn all these things. I'm in my doctoral program and I go back and I'm like, hey mom, look what I learned. And she's like, you're just learning that. And I'm like, dang, I'm trying to catch up, right? And it's, it's really, I think for her, maybe Ben and I, um, been this opportunity for us to really like dive into a lot of what she knows or doesn't know, right? Like some of our conversations have been about Afro-Mexicanidad and she's like, what's Afro-Mexicanidad? Um, you know, that gets complicated. So I think in many ways, it's been very helpful for some of our conversations, like to really move beyond like, oh, mija, como estas, right? Like, do uh, daughter, how are you, right? Like beyond that, it, it goes into these like really philosophical conversations. So 
but I don't think she would call herself a philosopher, which is ironic. That's awesome. Um, Alondra Gonzalez says, thank you for fighting for what you believe in and being so courageous and inclusive in your work and your teachings. Thank you. Um, I'm checking to see if we have any more uh, questions or comments on Facebook. If anybody has any other questions that they'd like to share, they're more than welcome to at this moment. You'd be more than welcome to take comments, questions. Well, I was just gonna say, uh, I really, I, I posted up in, in the Zoom chat, I said, I've taught courses about teaching oppositional practices. I feel uh, your work is just that. It's inspiring and shows how sometimes just existing is part of the resistance. As uh, the great Sandy Stone once told me, she's my mentor who, uh, taught me at UT Austin and, and is one of the founders of transgender uh, studies. And um, yeah, like we used to teach like what you, like how to create things off of the energy that you were being given. Cause that's basically what you have to do as you go through it because the whole time, and I went through this myself, I went to UT Austin and uh, I had some great mentors, but you, like you said, you'd go to some of these classes and they just had a wall up as to what you had to say and do and song and dance you had to put on before you could open your mouth to make an assertion about something that you believed that didn't even have anything to do with Western European philosophy or history or culture or theory, but had to do with your own assertions and your own lived reality. So I just really like, that really resonated with me. And um, how, like, how do you see yourself when you become a professor, like being able to create that space? And even as you, I, I feel like, and I could be like stretching out on this. I feel like you probably even do it as a basketball coach, like even taking that into consideration, but that's kind of my question. Yes. Um, thank you for that. That um, It's funny you did mention this basketball coach. I had to be very creative as basketball coach too. I, I remember having, I don't know, like just a brief tangent. I remember having girls that had never played basketball before, ever, ever, ever. And they were supposed to be the JV team. And I was like, okay, let's do this. Let's play dodgeball. If you can hit me with the ball, you get a Gatorade. And they really could not hit me. Like, I think the, the odds were totally in my favor. They just could not hit me. <laughs> but they really were motivated, right? Like to learn the, the form, to learn how to, like if you know how to play basketball, like how elbows out and how to like really throw that push and then flip, spin the ball. They were really motivated to get that down because <laughs> they wanted to hit their coach who had just made them run quite a bit. Um, and it's just a matter of like finding, okay, what will work for us here? What helps? What do you care about? What do you care about hating me and hitting me? Cool, let's work on that. Um, not in the classroom. <laughs> I, I definitely will say I, I take a different approach. I, I, I think there is a lot more to learn. What I hope I can offer in terms of my pedagogy is really um, saying to my students, like, you are knowers. Starting with that, you are a knower. You possess knowledge. You are someone who has knowledge. You are someone who is a philosopher. You have philosophized in your life. Your parents have philosophized in their lives. You all know things. I think that starting with that would be powerful. And I, I mean, and, and I say that because I think as first generation students, especially, um, and I, you know, it's not exclusive to us as bunches, but you know, you hear about this like whole imposter syndrome thing. That in part is because we're told we're not knowers, that we don't have knowledge, that the communities we came from didn't have knowledge, that, you know, in, and, and, and in some sense, white academia is not for us. That is, that is true institutions that are aimed at excluding our knowledge are not for us, that is true. However, that does not neglect the fact that we are knowers, right? And so that's, I think, a really powerful thing that I've worked on as I've been in academia, where I'm told, unfortunately, more often than I prefer, you're not doing philosophy, 
Well, where's the philosophy in that? Sounds like you're talking too much about the body. These are things where I'm like, no, no, no. I know things. Unfortunately, because you don't recognize this as knowledge, you try to delegitimize it. But this knowledge exists. So, so Joey, kind of just again to to like go back to your question, I think I'd be very explicit about where the starting point is. And the starting point is that they are knowers and that they have knowledge and they come from communities that have knowledge. That was awesome. <laughs> okay, uh, we have a couple comments and uh, questions. So uh, this one's from your mom, Denise. And she says, Te quiero mucho y te, um, y estoy muy orgullosa de ti. Tu mama. So that's awesome. Uh, that's mom. <laughs> um, Marco Mirales is asking, what philosophical piece would you recommend to students or really anyone to read? Uh. <laughs> um, so I, I always want to, I'm just, it's right here. I'm reading it right now. So I, I always want to go to Maria Lugones. I always want to go to Maria Lugones because she, for me, you know how some people say like they have their Gloria Saldua or they have their like, you know, Malcolm X or like she's she's my, for me, my Gloria Saldua. Um, she's a powerful writer, very powerful writer. However, with that said, I would probably not recommend her to anyone just wanting to read. The reason why is she is incredibly, incredibly dense. And, and, and what's beautiful of her writing and what's also one of the challenges of her writing is that she refuses to um, approach philosophy according to categories of division, of fragmentation, of hierarchy, of domination. So her approach where it gets really dense is her refusal to take on the language typical of philosophy. She really just kind of like swims and travels. And so you have to follow her movements. And so in trying to follow her movements, you sometimes get lost a little bit because you start thinking about your own self and you stop paying attention to her. And Maria Lugones is amazing, but I probably would not recommend her to start. Um, my sister recommends The Alchemist. <laughs> that's nice, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I, I, I would, I think Gloria and Saldua is great, but I would probably push on Luz en lo los, um, los Oscuro, which is Light in the Dark. That's the book I would probably push up. So I'm just gonna write right here. That's that's where I would go. Luz en lo oscuro. Yeah. Marco is giving his thumbs up, like in approval. He, he loves it. <laughs> the Aggie thumb up. <laughs> so so Marco, you better check that one out. I'm just kidding. Um, any other questions um, or comments from anybody? Well, first of all, I just wanted to, every time I hear you, and even when I'm talking to you just over coffee, I, you have this energy that as soon as I talk to you, there's a million things that I want to do because it's so inspiring and it's just like a good flex, flux of energy that um, you give everyone. Um, and I just wanted you to acknowledge it once more. Um, but my question is though, what are your plans? Um, and I know that you you love teaching and, and, and you're very passionate about empowering your students, but outside of the classroom, what are your plans on making your research and what you do available just to, to lay audiences to the public, to people out there who are not part of academia and that would really benefit from listening you know and you are empowered in your own knowledge of seeing and viewing the world. Uh, so what would I do? Um, I think there are numerous vehicles to do that. I think um, one that I find very helpful is music and another one art, visual art. Um, so I would probably go with murals. And the reason I would probably go with murals is, so I'm gonna get complex on this one. I think there's a multi-dimensionality about murals, mural making processes that are incredibly 
um, incredibly transformative. So, so think about, as I made that point, it's incredibly transformative. Think about what happens when murals are whitewashed. What is happening when a mural is whitewashed? And what does that mean? Literally, a mural gets white paint all over it and be, no longer becomes this mural in the community. It's a white wall. This wall has just now been erased. And there's paint under there. Well, perhaps then you would say it's not erased, right? There's paint under there, but it's been painted over. You cannot see it. You cannot access it anymore. When murals come on and they're giving you a history, they're giving you a history often. So I'm thinking very specifically about Chicana, Chicano, Chicanex murals. Murals in Los Angeles, um, and, and this is not exclusive to Los Angeles, but the murals in Los Angeles tell stories. They tell histories. They tell you about the social. They tell you often about the resistance that's taking place. And so I think murals are this, this opportunity to talk with people who are in the community where these murals exist and say, what does that mural mean to you? What is the history that it's telling you? Whose histories are these? Whose knowledges are these? And not in a possessive sense of like, it's mine and therefore no one else can engage it, but in a powerful sense to think about going, going, you know, returning to what I said with Joey, you are knowers. You are knowers. You know things. You're, you're able to move in this world in such a way that is not defined only by these like presidents who want to label you as like rapists and drugs, druggies or whatever these words that guy used. You are a knower. And so I think I think murals are a great way to have that kind of conversation because it's not coming from even though sometimes academics are involved, but it's not this like narrow academia sort of project. Those are community inspired projects more often than not. Those are projects more often than not that are engaged, that are standing for something and they're concrete. So when we talk about what's at stake, we're saying, look at these whitewashing of murals. That's meaning to change the space. Talk about gentrification, right? Change the space. That's meaning to erase histories. That's meaning to, deny people of the fact that they are knowers. Um, so so I think I think I would go with murals. <laughs> that was a great answer. Thanks so much, Denise. We uh, like I seriously, I like you know I'm a huge fan of your work and I'm lucky to call you um, a fellow um, academic within the or scholar in the making. Uh, here at a and but also a friend and a, a person I really look up to a lot as well. And so um, I'm very grateful for that and thankful for um, you being here with us today. Thank you all. I appreciate it. I appreciate you all giving me this space and allowing me to kind of do my thing with everyone. And um, I'm super grateful for, for you all to really create these sorts of the series that is allowing for these types of discussions to take place. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful for the work you all are doing. Thank you. And thank you to all the audience and my family, uh, and my partner who, who came out to check me out. Thanks. <laughs> shout out to Nick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, shout out to Nick. And the Dodgers and the Lakers. Y'all heard I'm from LA. It's a big, big time right now to be happy about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm a Lakers fan too, so I'm down with that. <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, Again, thank you so much, Denise. Um, okay, so let's uh, uh, get, uh, get ready and transition to our second guest. So our second guest is Dr. Roberto Avantmir. Dr. Avantmir is an associate professor at the Department of Communication at the University of Texas at El Paso, UTEP. Yeah, um, and is also affiliated uh, and is and is also affiliated uh, an affiliated faculty member. Um, in Chicano, Chicano Chicana Studies. His work looks at a discursive construction of Latino slash Hispanic identity, identities, and cultural issues in popular music and film. And fun fact, he was my former advisor at UTEP as well. So, you know, this is a real big deal for me to be able to um, interview him and to talk with him today. So, um, 
So uh, I'm really excited for this. So Dr. Ramir, how are you doing? I think you're on mute, Doc. There you, there you go. go. All right. Uh, hello, Anthony and everybody. Hello. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. And uh, hello, everybody. I hope you're well. Denise, nice to meet you. And thank you for sharing your story. I'm like, wow, man, I had to follow that, Anthony. Really? <laughs> She's all deep and philosophical and I have to follow that. Jeez. Uh, hey, you know, Doc, um, it's, it's <laughs> just, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I got nothing to, to back that up with. Uh, <laughs> I got nothing for that. But Y'all uh, are going to be disappointed in the second half of this uh, of this evening. Sorry. No, I know. No. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, um, like I said, I'm really grateful and thankful that you're here. And, um, for me, this is like a full one. Um, I don't know if it's 360, 180 type thing where it's, yeah, it's a full circle type thing that, um, speaking of trajectory, I just want to say you, I am here today. Like, um, you were the person who encouraged me to be a PhD student and, uh, you know, I don't want to get all teary-eyed and sentimental, but you're the reason why I am a PhD student. You pushed me to be here, and I'm forever thankful for you. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, man. Love you, man. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. You know, so uh, if it wasn't, if, Anthony, if it wasn't me, somebody else would have said it. Everybody else that was your professor would have told you the same thing. So it wasn't just me that saw that in you. I appreciate that. Um, but this isn't about me. This is about you. It's, it's, it's talking about you, Dr. Omir. So I'm curious, like, how and when did you decide to pursue a PhD or an academic career? Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is this is where uh, this is where things get kind of funny for me because um, when Anthony told me, you know, was inviting me, or uh, I got the email being invited for this for this conversation, I thought, you know what? I'm the worst person to ask for this conversation. I'm like, I'm like the worst story that you all need to hear. Um, and I say that because I didn't have a plan. I didn't have any ambition. Uh, I didn't have anybody that was a really good mentor to me. I didn't do well in school. You know, average, average kid coming out of high school, uh, you know, even before that, right? Uh, I guess I was like, you know, smart enough to have some potential in junior high and high school, but really average my whole life. Uh, my story is that I joined the Marines when I was 17 years old in my senior year of high school. And that's because uh, I, I didn't have anybody in front of me or before me that had told me that I could go to college, right? Uh, poor Mexican kid from like a Mexican neighborhood where nobody goes to college. Uh, and none of my family had ever gone to college and none of my friends were going to college, right? None of the kids I knew in school were going to college, right? So to me, it was like, you know, I thought college was for rich people. I thought college was for, you know, the, the wealthy, or maybe even something like, you know, like, you know, more stereotypical, like, oh, rich white kids go to college. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't think that was for me. Um, so long story short is I, I joined the Marines before I was even finished with high school. Uh, I went to Marine Corps boot camp like two weeks after graduating high school, uh, before I was even 18 years old. So I spent some time in the Marines. This is like uh, late early 90s, early 90s. I was in the U.S. Marines, and you know, four or five years in the Marines will teach you. Me being who I am, like many of most most of you, I imagine, like yeah, this is not for me. You know, uh, I did it. It was fine. It wasn't my lifestyle. It wasn't my thing. I figured out who I was in my early 20s. I'm like, yeah, I think I maybe want to want to try college a little bit. You know, see what that's all about. Um, so I went home. My home is El Paso, Texas, UTEP. All my family's here. So I came home to UTEP and I tried uh, college and I liked it, you know, got my undergraduate degree, rolled that over into a, a, a master's degree, you know, just a few years later. And then I was looking at PhD programs, which is, you know, sort of my larger story. But what I'm trying to say is, <laughs> Anthony, man, I'm sorry if this is like a bad answer, but like, I didn't have a plan. I didn't have somebody telling me, I didn't have like an idea what my future could be. I had no idea that I could go to college. I feel like I'm like the worst person to ask for this story. <laughs> no, I think that that's something to highlight, that's important to highlight though, because that happens to a lot of people. And um, and there's a lot of times where we as, as students ourselves are just, and this is something that happened to me and you know this personally, is that I wasn't sure if this was the right step for me, you know, and we, we aren't, always sure if you know um education's the right thing you know um luckily like 
you know, we have, you know, we had people in our, you know, a lot of us have people in our lives that are always encouraging us to go pursue school and stuff. But I know, I think that that story is definitely worthy of uh, this discussion because everybody has their own pathway and trajectory. And I think that, you know, to show where you first started and to where you are now, that's a huge Dr. Alamir. I think that that's amazing. Um, in the chat, uh, Joey wrote, uh, Dr. Joseph Lopez wrote, um, I call him Joey, um, and Anthony has shared great things about you, Dr. Ramir. We look forward to hearing about your own path. Uh, Denise said that she's so glad for that. Um, Joey said, uh, that's what happens to many of us. I was told I'd work well with my hands and should, should do um, air conditioner repair, which technically I could have done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the story, right? That's our story, right? Many of us are not funneled into uh, universities, even just applications, right? Um, many of us are not funneled into those programs or taught or coached or, you know, apply, told how to apply, which is, you know, hopefully what they're doing for a lot of kids now, I would hope, especially young Latinos, right? Latinx kids. But back then, I graduated in 89, 1989, and they just weren't doing that. They weren't doing that at all. Uh, I wonder how much they're doing it nowadays, you know? It's a great question. Um, uh, another question I have for you is, what are some hurdles and obstacles that you might have gone through um, while pursuing a PhD or in academia in general? Ooh, wow, hurdle, hurdles and obstacles. Well, I would, I would, uh, I would just kind of try to, to say, did you listen to uh, Denise's presentation? Uh, she she kind of she kind of went through it, right? Uh, you know, um, the the material that you're learning is, you know. 80 90 percent white you're you're trying to find yourself in the material that you're reading and the topics the themes the the literature and you can't find yourself uh you get to programs where there are no latino faculty or if you are you know there's one and uh interestingly enough right when you when you do find a one uh you know they're not always friendly you know it's kind of like they're in their little a little silo they got this area right and they carved it out and they're looking at you like what do you want you know get out of here right they're not going to be friendly just because you're latino or latinx right they don't care they're like whatever get out of my face uh you know so not having not having mentors not having faculty that are automatically going to be nice to you um really uh being you know denise said it right one out of how many students did you mention uh, when you're when you're one out of you know a, a program that just lit in a a, a slew of masters and doctoral students and you're like the one you know uh and you're very isolated and that that comes personally it comes at a cost personally right when you're isolated personally socially right but also even being in the classroom right when you're in a room full of a bunch of people that don't look like you and obviously you're the lone minority or the lone latino there was one other african-american guy that i that I was in my PhD program with. But anyways, you know, stuff like that, right? It's, it's the feeling of outsiderness, the feeling of loneliness, the feeling of uh, being outside of the box in every single way, right? When you get to the classroom and the kids have never seen a Latino or Mexican professor or even an instructor at that point, right? And they're looking at you like, you know, what are you doing here? And, and undergraduate students feel like they can say whatever they want to you because a, you're not a full PhD professor yet, and B, you're Mexican anyway, so it's like, you know, they can say whatever they want to, you know, stuff like that, um, and then you get to, you know, the way people treat you, like I said, the grad students, grad students will tend, uh, in my opinion, will tend to be sort of friendly and nice to you, but, you know, when you were applying to, to PhD programs and stuff like that, and, uh, you know, now you're trying to be seen as equal to because you've got the degree, and you're trying to be a professor, and you're trying to get the job or whatever, um, and, you know, people will not necessarily treat you that way, you know, all kinds of things. When you go to a job interview and uh, somebody will compliment you about your English and say something like you're so articulate and you're like, well, yeah, I was fucking born here. What do you, you know, what's my English supposed to be like? You know, stuff like that. Uh, we deal with it on every level. We deal with it on so many levels. And uh, 
I mean, but you know, I don't want to sound like a, a complainer because I'm, I'm by nature, not a complainer. Uh, my nature is to just, you know, put your head down, keep working, keep fighting, do the work, do, do what you're supposed to do. Um, but to answer your question, I mean, it's all of those things that Denise was mentioning, you know, it's, it's the uphill climb. It's, it's everywhere you go, being an outsider, right. Being the one person, being the minority, it's just, it's kind of endless, you know? And by the way, I feel like I should tell you, you know, uh, spoiler alert, and I don't want to ruin, I don't want to ruin anybody's, uh, evening, uh, but when you get when you get your PhD and when you get that 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 tenure track job, right, it's going to be the same thing. It's it's going to be the same then. It's not going to be like all of a sudden you made it and it's different. And those people that are now your colleagues are like at a different level. It's not like that. You're still going to be the one. You're still going to be on the outside. You're going to still be the one Mexican or Hispanic or Latino, right? It's it's going to continue to be that way. Uh, and a lot of this stuff is stuff that you told me before too in our conversations that we've had together. So yeah, I mean, I, I it yeah, I see it too, you know, already at like my stage and I, I I see it. And so a lot of this stuff that you're mentioning is absolutely like right, you know. Yeah. Like even when you go to conventions and stuff too. Um so um some questions from the chat we have. Uh Joey asking, um, how did your PhD come about? Um, what field did you study and how did you uh, come into that calling? Um, okay, so again, <laughs> you know, this is where I feel like I'm the worst guy to invite to this party. Um, my, my PhD was not a plan, uh, was not, I guess, you know, supposed to happen by, you know, in my opinion, whatever it was, it was all a complete accident in the sense that, um, you know, I came home to El Paso, did my did my bachelor's degree. Uh, I applied for the master's program just because I didn't know what else to do. So I, you know, stayed two years later. I've got a master's degree in communication. And then at that point, I still didn't know what to do with myself. Um, a funny thing happened in that I came to UTIP at a time when there was like a group of us uh, graduate students that were sort of all in classes together. And I happened to be lucky in the sense that there were a couple of people in front of me that were finishing their master's degree and then started applying for PhD programs. So Anthony, you know some of them, uh, the rest of you all, if you're familiar with professors in communication studies, um, Stacy Sowards, who's now at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, she was like a year ahead of me and she finished her master's and she went to a PhD program at Kansas. And then right after her, there was a guy named Frank Perez, Dr. Frank Perez, who's my colleague at UTEP now. And he went to a PhD program at New Mexico. And then right after him, there was a guy named uh, Richard Pineda, uh, Dick Pineda, uh, who also is at UTEP now and is my friend, but he went to a PhD program at Wayne State, Wayne State University in Detroit, right? And so I was like, you know, uh, further down that list, but I saw these people ahead of me that were friends of mine and they were grad students and they went on to these PhD programs. So that just like, you know, uh, sort of sparked something in me where I saw my friends going to PhD programs and for some reason I thought, huh, is that, is that what I'm supposed to be doing? You know, is that what I should be doing is applying to PhD programs? And again, I say this with the qualification that I wasn't smart enough to have a plan on my own and I wasn't smart enough to like have this idea of what I should be doing. I just saw these people in front of me, my graduate student friends, you know, and I thought, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to try that. I'm going to, I'm going to apply to PhD programs. So that's what I did. Uh, I applied to, to PhD programs in communication and I got into some and I got turned down by some, but then the ones you got into, you know, you're trying to figure out what's, which one's the best and who's offering you the best package. Right. But I feel like I didn't know what I was doing early on. I just kind of figured it out along the way. Um, so I ended up going into a PhD program at the University of Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, studying communication. And of course, when I got to, to Utah studying communication, you know, not only am I the, the only Latino uh, uh, grad student in, in the program, but, um, you know, they're the professors that, that you're working with, like when you say you want to do something like Latinx studies or Chicanx study, right? They don't know what you're talking about. They don't, they've never studied that. And they're doing like mainstream communication studies. And to some extent, you can kind of bend, uh, you know, critical cultural studies, feminist stuff, GLBTQ plus stuff. You can bend it and make it seem like it's communication studies, which is what we all do, right? We've all done that. But, you know, going into a program where those professors that are your, your teachers now, your professors, and you're going to be your mentors, like they have no idea, like, you know, what you're doing and what you want and what you're trying to study. And so it's a matter of like just finding it on your own, uh, trying to make them listen to you, uh, being, I guess, brave enough to speak up sometimes and trying to assert yourself. 
when your class syllabus has everything on it except any Latinos or Chicanas or anything, you know, uh, you have to go find it, you have to insert it, you have to fight for it, you have to speak up for it, and trying to make it happen in your own work when you're writing your own papers and then eventually your, your thesis and eventually doctoral dissertation, right? You have to do the work, you have to do the, I guess, you know, convincing people, you have to do the work of, of getting people to see your side, seeing your argument, why you want to do this, why it's valid, why it's important, you know? That's, that's what it is. That was great. Um, yeah, a lot, like a lot of this, I just feel like it's, it's, I'm having flashbacks to <laughs> like when I was working with you again, that was awesome. Um, so Al Alondra Gonzalez is asking, how did you stay motivated, um, along this, uh, uh, path of yours and when you, and, uh, whenever you felt excluded or pushed to the side? Ooh, good question. Uh, Alondra, uh, thank you for the question. That's a great question. Um, to be honest with you, I, I don't I don't have any uh, I don't have any great answer other than maybe it's personal to each and every one of us. Like you got to find your own thing that drives you. You got to find um, I don't know. You got to find something that motivates you and inspires you to do the work. Right. Um, I can't say that I have anything like you know anything like a special answer or anything special that I did, other than I got into a PhD program and I made my mind up I was going to do it. Um, and I even had this attitude, like, you know, even if I don't get that tenure check job, I, I'm still going to do it. I want to get my PhD to see if I can do it, if I can finish it. Right. It was like a, for me, it was like a personal challenge to myself. Um, but you know, when you, when you, when you feel excluded and push aside, it's hard. I mean, let's, let's just say it, it's hard. And I don't, I don't know what's, what's a good answer for that. Other than for me, it was just, uh, my nature is just keep working, you know, put your head down, just keep working. Uh, we've all been there in those nights. I think you all, everybody who's listening or watching has probably been there, you know, those lonely nights on the computer when nobody else is around and it's you and your computer writing a paper, or maybe you're reading a book or you're in bed with that nightlight reading that article. You know, I mean, you, you just got to keep doing it. I don't know what else to say other than uh, my nature is just, you know, put your head down and do the work. And uh, that's, that's what got me through everything that I've done is my nature is just, you know, put your head down and keep working. And I, I guess, I guess an underlying assumption is if you do the work and if you do what you're supposed to, and if you work hard, that reward will eventually come. Um, I should have said that, right. Cause that's the dream, right. That's the, that's the motivating, I guess, assumption that we all start with, but we all know that it may not necessarily come to fruition. Let's be honest, right. That may not be there for whatever reason. Uh, but my attitude has always been, uh, you know, just keep working, just keep pushing, just get to the end goal. Um, whether your PhD takes you three years or four years or five years or six, you just keep working, keep doing it, right? Don't quit, just keep working, right? Uh, the system is set up for you to quit. Maybe other people want you to quit. Other professors have, you know, a bunch of advisees. They, they, they maybe would be happy or it would be okay if you quit. Maybe they don't care, right? You just got to keep working, you know, just keep doing it. Keep doing it, keep plugging away, do the work. Very cool. Uh, yeah, I that's I remember when I um, first started here at a and that's the advice you gave me to put my head down and just keep working hard, you know, and I thought that that was some of the best advice you gave me. And other pieces of advice that I and I like to tell um, my students too is something that you always tell me and I've told like my committee members too is um, find something you're passionate about and roll with that. You, there's two words that you, you told me the, the day that I started working my thesis and they've stuck with me since then and it's geek out mm -hmm. and uh, since then that's what I keep in mind all the time as I'm writing my papers and I'm working on the stuff that I love and, and care about and so um, with that being said I want to talk to you a little bit about um, your research and it kind of uh, uh, it works so well with what Joey's asking too so I'll ask what Joey's asking because it's a way better question um, uh, how do you take these experiences you've had um, and your path to impart into your pedagogy and mentoring of students second question what are your main topics you'd like to study and do uh, scholarship around and does your past play a role in it Ooh, good question. Thank you, Joey. I appreciate that. So uh, let me answer. Let me answer the the latter question first, because the first question maybe is a little bit uh, deeper, and you can get more into it. 
so to answer the, the answer, to answer the second question, uh, the main topic that I study, as Anthony, as Anthony introduced me, I'm, I'm a communication scholar, right? We we study, I study, you know, media, media and communication, right? Uh, if I could put it to people like my parents, my parents, my my sisters who don't know what I do, right? I say, well, I, I study, you know, I study media representations, which could include, you know, anything from like television representation, representations of Latinos and Mexicanos in like media, television, film, stuff like that. I'm interested in how identity gets constructed or you know, portrayed through, through, through media, right? Uh, we could specify television and film is the sort of easy example to go to when you say, this is what I do. Uh, ironically, perhaps, uh, I'm interested in passion. Uh, I'm interested in and passionate about popular music. So I came up as a grad student doing my PhD work and into my first years as a professor, really studying popular music. And I wanted to study popular music. I wanted to identify myself as a popular music scholar. And that's what I was like, sort of like 100% focused on like popular music. Um, so I consider myself like, you know, a popular music scholar. Um, since I've been, uh, I sort of, you know, speaking about the, uh, you know, the full circle, I, I moved away from El Paso. I was a professor in Boston at Boston College. Uh, when I returned back to UTEP after 11, 12 years of being away, um, I have been doing film and cinema since I've been at UTEP. Uh, so as of about 10 years ago, I've been doing film and cinema studies. So I now consider myself a, a film and, and cinema scholar to some extent, right? So my two main areas are popular music and, and film, if I, can, if I can answer it that way, all in the name of this bigger thing called communication studies, right? Uh, but to get more specific, popular music and film. Um, the second part of the question is, oh, excuse me, which is actually the first part, the first question, right? How do you take these experiences in your, in your path and impart it into your pedagogy and, and mentoring of students? Um, I don't know how to answer that question other than um, I was very passionate about music when I started off and as a grad student. And then, like I said, nowadays, I'm, I'm doing more film studies than I'm doing music studies, uh, which is neither here nor there, but I feel like, you know, the answer to that question for me is you have to be super passionate and engaged about what you're studying. And this is what Anthony was talking about, right? What you were talking about, what I told you when you were a master's student, which is you got to love what you do. You got to be fascinated with what you're doing. You got to be obsessed with what you're doing. Um, if it's popular music for me, it was comic books for Anthony. It might be, you know, feminism or some angle for somebody else. It might be philosophy for somebody else, right? Whatever you're doing, you got to love it. You got to live it and breathe it because if you don't, it's going to be work. And, and of course, we're all going to do the work and it's going to be work to some extent, to a great extent, it's going to be work, but you got to love it to stay in it. You got to love what you're doing and you got to be passionate and focused because you're just, you just want to do it which is to say, it's almost like you got to have this attitude about, you know, if I don't get a PhD or if I don't get a, a tenure track job, would I still be doing this? Would I still be doing this work? And I mean, like writing this paper or working on this idea or doing this analysis or reading these articles, you know, you got to love what you're doing. Um, I kind of feel like if I hadn't, if I hadn't become a professor, uh, I would still be sort of the same geek nerd that I am about music or film uh, I would still be the same person, right? And you got to find that that sort of sweet spot. You got to find that thing that you're passionate about, that you're interested in, that you don't want to let go, because in some way it's part of your identity. It's part of the core of who you are. You're just interested in it, right? You're just engaged. You're passionate about it, and you have to do it, right? Um, you got to find that. And I think uh, I'm trying to loosely answer that first question, but it's it's sort of this idea that. Um, when you are passionate about something, I think that's what I'm trying to teach students, right? Uh, both at the undergrad level and of course at the graduate level as well is um, find something that you're interested in, find that angle. Because if you find that angle, it makes it really, really fun to do. It, if you find something that you're interested in, right? You'll find something that you're passionate about. It's like easier to do the work or it's work, but you still like it or it's it's not that much work because you're passionate about it. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I would say that to students, you know, you gotta, you gotta find something that you're interested in. And at the university level, the beautiful thing about whether we're studying communication or media or philosophy or, or art, you know, whatever you're studying is you can, you can find an angle, right? And the trick is, as you all know, 
is, is to find that angle, right? To figure out an angle where it makes you really, really passionate about the subject or the theme, you know what I'm saying? Figure out how you can get into it where you're really, really excited about studying that or researching that or reading that article or reading that book. You know, you gotta find that angle. Very cool. Uh, Denise, uh, who just presented, uh, is asking what publishing advice would you offer to young scholars? Ooh, good question for the, uh, for you, you're finishing, you're finishing your dissertation, right? Or are you done or where are you? I was like, am I allowed to talk right now? <laughs> um, I am starting in my fourth year. So it's fourth that year. time. It's a four, it's a six year program. That's right. Okay. So um, good question for the, for the fourth year PhD student, right? Well, um, I will tell you all, you, you don't know this name, but there's a guy that was one of my professors at Utah, the University of Utah. Uh, her name is Maruf Hussain. It's spelled like Hassan, but he says Hussain. Maruf Hussain, who's known in communication studies. And the guy is known for being really, really prolific. He published a lot when I was there in the late 90s, early 2000s. He published books. He published, I mean, if, if you looked at his CV now, he has like hundreds of articles, right? Like, like one of those ridiculous people, like the people that you have at Texas A&M, you know, that level of caliber scholar, right? They, they just people that just published a lot. Um, and he told me when I was a grad student in his class, he told me, um, any publication is a good publication. And I thought it was a joke, right? When I was like a first or second year doctoral student. But, you know, when you're, when you're there, by the time you were a third year and a fourth year, um, I kind of figured out what he was saying, right? He, basically what he's saying is, uh, take every single opportunity to get a publication because what you are trying to do, and I hate to say this, right? I'm, I'm like, the last person thought I would ever say this in my life, right? But what you are doing is you're, you're, you all right now are building a resume. You're building your CV and every line uh, somebody's going to scrutinize and they want to see what you've done, right? You're building your, your resume, you're building your CV. Uh, and the more you have, the better, you know, honestly, the more you have, the better. Um, so if you come out of a doctoral program with no publications, and I don't think I'm telling you anything you all don't know already, right? Which is, you know, if you come out of a doctoral program and you don't have any publications, right, you know, that's a harder, harder to get a job like that. It's harder to get a tenure track job like that. And if you have, you know, I don't know what they're doing nowadays, like, you know, one or two or three or four or five, you have a little bit of chance of somebody looking at your beta, right, your CV. And if you have, geez, you know, somebody, I can imagine these big time programs, if you have five or 10 publications, right, you know, you can automatically slide into a big time job, I'm guessing, you know, at, at, a, at a top tier university, you get what I'm saying? And what I'm trying to say is, um, you know, I, I didn't take it that seriously when, when Maruf Hussain was my, was my professor, but when you get into that fourth year, and I took a fifth year for my PhD, when you get into that fifth year uh, and you're putting out your resume, trying to get a tenure track job, right? I mean, you got to add, you got to build that resume, any, any publication, right? Book chapters, conference presentations, of course, we know counts, but any publication, whether it's a... Um, you know, a big time journal, uh, an important journal, which we'd all like to do. Uh, but even if you're doing like grad student journal, even if you're doing a uh, regional journal, you know, uh, don't discount that stuff. That stuff's important, right? That stuff means that you're, that you're publishing, that you're doing the work, that you know what it's like to carry an article from, from the initial stages of like a manuscript in a, in a grad level seminar to, to a, develop, a further, more developed uh, article and then submitting it, right? Because that's work and then doing the reviews and then taking the feedback and sticking with it and doing the work, you know? I mean, that shows level, uh, a level of commitment that not everybody has, right? You got to fight to do that work. You got to not get discouraged to do that work. You got to keep doing the work to get to that point, right? Um, so it's 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 publish anywhere you possibly can. Uh, another professor that I, uh, that that was one of my professors at Utah told me, uh, you know what? We always try to tell grad students to to publish articles, right? That's the dream. That's the goal, and do that, right? By all means, we should you should aspire to that. He also told me, um, you know, if you're not publishing articles yet. And this is when I was like, I think a second or third year uh, PhD student. He said, do book reviews. Why not publish a book review? Uh, publish some book reviews. Uh, those get published in the journal. It's another line on your Vita. It's practice. It's kind of the same practice and sort of the idea of submitting it to a journal. And then you're going to get comments and feedback. Then you do the revisions. He said, you know, do book reviews. And yeah, that may not be like, you know, top tier level, you know, publication, but you're a grad student. 
and that's okay. You know, nobody's expecting you to have top tier level publication at when you're regressing, right? So do things like book reviews. And my point is that, you know, something as simple as a book review will count as a publication, right? Those are considered, and they've always been considered, you know, service to the discipline. Uh, on your Vita, on your CV, it looks like another line. Uh, in practice, in personal practice, it looks like you've done the work of going through the motions. And I hate to say the motion, I don't mean that in that way, but I mean, you've gone through the process of, uh, you know, submitting it, getting feedback and going through the months that it takes to publish stuff or years that it might take to publish something and to see it go all the way through to when it gets published in a journal. You know what I mean? So my advice simply is uh, do everything you can. Uh, take every opportunity to, to publish, uh, you know, whatever you can, wherever you can do it. Um, it's just going to benefit you in the long run. It's not going to hurt you to publish. It's just going to help you to publish. Right. So take every opportunity. Awesome. Okay, so the next question is uh, from Joey again, and uh, and he's um, providing his perspective, like as an instructor as well. And he teaches a popular culture class, and he even mentioned right here. You mentioned music. I am teaching a music, radio, and recording class. I see how music can drive students to create academic works, entertainment, and everything in between. What kind of works in music? What kind of works in the music field have you created? Do you have any dream research that you would like to perform, aka a big project that goes beyond a book or an article? Wow, good question, Joey. Man, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, let me ask you this, Joey, if I may. Uh, what do you mean by works? Uh, what, what do you mean by that? So like a, a lot of what I'm seeing kind of be as a 21st century academic is uh, people creating blogs, creating documentaries, oral histories that are that go beyond just being published in an article or in a book, but that are like live living text online. And when I say text, I mean photo, video, and audio, and 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 um, and actual text. And so I was just wondering, because I think you know, you mentioned uh, uh, popular music, and I think about uh, Texas music, and I think about conjunto, and I think about how there's so much not documented in mm -hmm. terms of Texas music. I mean, you, you can go to very specific scholars like uh, uh, Marco Cervantes over at UTSA is doing work. And I mean, there's some pockets, but uh, I often think about all the little stories of, of musicians all around the US and the world uh, where we can have these living texts. And I just, I didn't know if that was something you've done. I, I, I've seen some, uh, that you've done some interviews, you know, um, before and I was just wondering if you've like thought about that. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I appreciate the question. Uh, I love it. I love that you're asking that. Um, I kind of feel like your question, Joey, is like, um, uh, I feel like it's a question for somebody that's younger than me <laughs> in the sense that uh, I know you all, you know, you all are young, you all do, you all do blogs, you all do videos like nothing, you all, everybody's got a podcast, right? And that's a cool thing, right? And I'm, I'm old enough, I'm old enough to be like, not, not that, you know what I'm saying? Um, I'm old enough to be of the generation where, uh, you know, do, doing everything, I mean, I, okay, I, 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 I'm sounding like I'm making an excuse, right? Um, I feel like I'm making an excuse for the fact that I'm not making videos or podcasts or something. And, and I don't mean to say that it's not an excuse. It's just not where I've been professionally speaking. Um, when I got into my, my professional work, uh, which is being a professor, you know, having the PhD and being a, a professor on the tenure track, it, it was books and articles. It was books and articles. It was books and articles, right? That's what you have to do. Um, so that's what I did, right? That's what I've been doing for like, you know, the past 15, 16 years, right? But your question is a really good one, Joey, because I really like the fact that what you're getting at is, um, you know, what, what else can we do besides, besides the books and articles, right? Besides the visual and the textual, what else can we do? So I absolutely love the question. I just kind of feel like, you know, I, I, I wasn't trained to do anything else before then. And everything that I, that I could do, the stuff that you mentioned, uh, I, I could certainly pick that up now. And I could try to do it now. I just feel like it, I would be an amateur at it, right? I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a person that makes films, right? I study films as text, right? Uh, I study them for for representation and images and stuff like that, right? I read texts. Uh, same thing with music. I, I read music 
as, as a text, right? As a textual sort of like object, so to speak, right? And that's just where my training has been and where my academic work has been for the last 15, 16 years. Um, but that doesn't mean that I don't love your question. I really, and I'm, I'm being totally honest and genuine here. I love the question, right? I love the question. Um, let me let me throw this at you. Um, and you're a communication guy. Or are you a communication guy? I have a I have a PhD in radio, television, and film from UT ah, Austin. Or TF. That's right. Okay. And I right. got it. I was there from 2000 to 2010. Yeah. And I, you know I, I have a PhD in media studies, but I've always been labeled as the computer guy. <laughs> so I do video production, audio production, web, nice. social media. Excellent. But you know, I actually studied Foucault, Baudour, Marx, Engels. You know, all of all of what the canon that Denise was kind of referring to. Yeah. You know, I had to go through that, yeah. and I had to speak that speak, and I had to write those papers. And I was told that if I don't publish an article, if I don't do a book review, if I don't do these things, you'll never be a good professor. You won't make it. So they were right because I'm a uh, I'm a, an associate professor of the practice. Nice. I'm not a tenure track professor. Mm. So it's it is a different realm because of that. But that's I mean I did get I did become an associate tenure track at another university prior to this. But my point is is just that I'm trying to see like how do we break down those anxieties of our students in the 21st century that are able to express themselves beyond what we were taught, beyond what we were shown? How do we not be the pillars that uh, we were pushing against when we were in school? But like, uh, I honestly, I'm, what I'm really interested in asking is like, what is, like, what is your research? Like, what, what are you passionate about? Like we talk about passion, like what are some of the music uh, uh, texts that you're taking apart or like approaches that you're using? Because I'd really like to hear about that. Even if it is an article or a book that you worked on, I'm not looking. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. On that note of text, I, 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 I didn't answer. I would love to hear that. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, but so let me say this, right? So, so one of my one of my things that I'm that I'm working on to answer the big project, which you just mentioned, which is a book. Um, I, I've got a couple. I've got a couple of books in the works that I'm sort of one one's one's halfway done, and one's like my next one is a dream project after that, which is an edited collection on. Um, popular music in communication studies. Um, and I'm saying that because for you, and I think anybody else that's out there that's a communication scholar, for anybody that studied popular music as media, as communication, there was a book way back in 1987 that was titled like Popular Music and Communication. And um, ever since then, there's been a lot of stuff that happened musically, popular culture wise, right? There's been a lot of stuff that happened and there's no edited anthology on popular music. There's been a ton of research that's been published by individuals uh, as books, there's been a ton of stuff in, in journal articles, uh, but there's no sort of updated anthology edited collection on popular music and communication. You can look it up. Um, and sort of that's kind of a, an idea that I have in the back of my head. But your question was not a book, not an article, right? So let me throw this at you, Joey. And if you're a filmmaker, uh, you, you know, maybe you should, <laughs> let's work on something together. I have a dream. I have a dream for a film. Uh, and this will answer, this will answer the part of like the question about what I'm working on. I am currently working on an article. I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to talk about myself. This is kind of difficult because I'm, I'm a shy person and I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, I'm doing some important groundbreaking research. Uh, I'm not that guy, but I am currently working on an article. You're not going to believe it on uh, tamales. <laughs> and I hope you all appreciate that, right? Tamales. Uh, I found Anthony, you read, you read a draft of this article, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah. Okay. And it's funny that you're mentioning this too. Like, in the process of making um, the showing trajectory lecture series, yeah. Joey, Johnny, and a couple of others um, the, of the people behind the scenes of, of this whole lecture series, we were having a discussion of maybe doing like something on like Mexican food and tacos and things like that. Oh, and kidding. so um, like we were thinking about it, like looking at it in like cultural studies aspect about looking at Mexican food. So like, I remember that tamale paper though. I remember reading it in one oh, of your classes. That's cool, dude. I love it. Okay. So, so let me just finish my point real quick is that Anthony has read a draft of this paper that I've been working on for about, honestly, it's been about five or six years now. Um, but it's not published yet, but Joey, to answer your question, I've been working on a, on a manuscript that, uh, articulates tamales, yes, tamales, the Mexican food, to popular music. 
because I discovered a string of songs that are African-American blues singers going all the way back to the earliest date. The earliest song I found was like the 1890s. And there's a string of songs by African-American blues artists, some of them jazz, but really mostly blues, early 1900s, 1910s, 1920s, where African-Americans are singing about hot tamales. So, you know, 10 years ago, I was like, why are black people singing about hot tamales? And that was really honestly the, the research question I started out with. But it has turned into this larger project because I'm trying to figure out, like, why do African Americans have this tradition of singing about hot tamales? And then how, how do we connect that to tamales, which we know is very obviously a Mexican food. So it turned into this paper. Uh, I've been working on it. Uh, <laughs> tamala, I love it. Yes. Uh, uh, it has turned into this, this, this paper, which is not published yet, but it's kind of long. So I'm actually thinking about turning it into a larger book project. And to answer your question, Joey, um, I even thought this would be like a really cool documentary. Like I'm thinking about a documentary and that's because I have people that I work with here at UTEP, some of whom are filmmakers, documentarians, uh, both my colleagues, but also some students that I work with. And I know they make films and I'm like, man, maybe I could turn this whole tamal thing into a documentary, which is really about music and why black people are singing about hot tamales. So it has sort of started a, a thing in my brain about how can I turn this into a documentary? So to answer your question, that, that's one example of the kind of work that I'm doing really in the name of popular music you know, slash communication, but I'm actually thinking about sort of the further down the road where if, if this would be sort of a dream project for me, I could also make it a documentary that would be shown. And I think that would be really cool, you know, years down the road or maybe soon, who knows? That's cool. I didn't know that, that you, you wanted to do that. That's super cool. Um, so uh, if anyone else has any questions or comments, we'd be more than welcome to be um, accepting any, any more uh, questions or comments as well. Um, so this, this might be like a more personal question for me um, since I have this coming up. What advice do you have for people work um, or like graduate students and master's students or PhD students um, who have like comprehensive exams coming up? What advice do you have for them? Woo, uh, tough question, man. Um, uh, okay, so I'm seeing the question on the chat. It says, can you tell us what comps are, Anthony? So I'm just going to answer that for you. Okay, Anthony. Uh, comprehensive uh, comps, comps means comprehensive exams. So for anybody that doesn't know, when you're in a PhD program, you do your typical sort of like two, three years of coursework. And at the end of your coursework, which means taking classes and writing papers, you got to do comprehensive exams. And comprehensive exams, I actually don't know how you do it at, at Texas A&M, Anthony. Maybe this is where you want to jump in. But let me tell you what I did at Utah. Mm -hmm. At Utah, it was comprehensive exams means, you know, comprehensive exams, meaning you're going to have to pass this test. After all the coursework that you've done, you have to pass this test. And so basically, they stick you in a room for like four days in a row with nothing but your laptop, no notes, no books, and they give you questions. And you have to sort of write a paper just from scratch, from your head, right out of your brain. And you have to like, you know, answer the question, whatever question they give you. And then when you're done, you have to give it to them. Uh, there's a computer there, there's a flash drive. I mean, you, you can, you know, save it to a flash drive and you can print it and you, you give it to your professor. So it's like, you know, you're in there for the full day or hours at least answering, answering this big question. And so you got to do that for like four or five days in a row. And then you're done. That's the comprehensive exam, right? You've been there for days, for hours. And then they get to judge your work. They get, they're basically judging you on sort of like thinking on the fly, thinking with no notes. It's, a, it's an exam with, you know, no notes and, you know, no help, whatever. Uh, and then, you know, a week or two later, they'll get back to you and grade you and tell you how you did and whether you passed or not, right? So in order to proceed to the doctoral dissertation project stage, you have to pass your comprehensive exams first, right? Anthony, is that how you all do it? I don't know how you all do it there. So, um, so like, like this is a conversation you and I've had too. Mine starts up this Friday, so this is why I'm asking it too. Um, but um, the way that we're the, so there, like, there's that way that you mentioned. There's the in-house one, but due to the pandemic going on, I'm going to be doing the the, the take-home exam. And so the take home exam is a 10 day process here and uh, it's open book and I'll be getting in my case, I'll be getting all four, four questions at once. And so from there, I'll be working on them um, and like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. So uh, hopefully that tells us what comps are. Uh, and uh, to try to answer the question as best as I can. Um, I mean, I mean, I, I could give you, I could give you the, uh, the, the sort of really obvious advice, which is turn off your phones, turn off your social media, uh, get your head focused, stay in the game, do the work, study, right? That stuff is pretty obvious, right? Um, but I think you all, you all are dealing with nowadays, you all, your generation is dealing with a lot more social media and more temptation than I was dealing with back in 2003 and 2004, right? In 2003, 2004, we had, I had a, I had a Motorola Razor, you know, a little flip phone, right? And uh, Facebook was a new thing that existed at Harvard and not everybody was on the Facebook yet. You get what I'm saying, right? So I think you all have it harder because you have more distraction. So if you're asking me, me personally, uh, you got to figure out how to turn that stuff off while you're studying, you know, while you're studying, while you're getting prepared for comps, you know, uh, turn that stuff off, give yourself two, three, four, five hours a night while you're studying, turn that stuff off. And I'm not against social media. I have a smartphone, obviously, we're all doing it. Uh, but for the purpose of comps, you got to give yourself dedicated study time, man. You got to focus, uh, turn that stuff off and then turn it back on when you're, when you're just done and you're tired, turn it back on. You know what I'm saying? You can't have it all open while you're studying. You can't have it all open while you're working. Um, my, my other answer to that question is, um, you know, you've been working at this for three, four, sometimes five, six years. Uh, if you include your master's program. Uh, you've been, you know, you could count another year and a half, two years of work that you've been doing it, right? Uh, so my attitude is, my feeling personally is, if you are not ready for it by now, you're never going to be ready for it. You know, I kind of feel like the, the comprehensive exam should be kind of a reward, if I can put it that way. And that sounds really nerdy and dumb. Like reward, what are you talking about? Well, what I mean by is you've been doing the work, you've been there, you know, you've been a dedicated student, you've enrolled in the classes, you've done the work, you've done the papers, you know, you've been in it, uh, you're in the mud. And so comprehensive exams is your opportunity to show, look, professors, this is what I know. I've done all the work, I've been reading all the readings, I've done these papers, and I get to show you how smart I am. I get to show you how educated I am. And, you know, like we were talking about earlier, both Joey and, and Denise, based on your conversations, right? I get to show you what my perspective is on philosophy or communication or art or history. You know, I get to show you how I think now. So it's a little bit, I think of it like in a really nerdy way. I think of it like a reward. You get to show people what you know, how you think. It's your opportunity to speak. Let me put it that way. It's your opportunity to speak. Uh, and that's a really cool way to think about it, right? Because if you get in that moment where you're answering this question or you have to talk about, you know, the, whatever this philosopher that they made you read, whatever, well, now's your chance to say how you interpret it, right? What it means to you and how it's been significant for you or, or not significant to you. Um, you know, you've done the work, you, you've earned that right to be there and it's your opportunity to, to shine, if I can put it that way. And I say that because I'm a real big nerd and I'm a real big geek, you know, I read all those readings, I read those, those books, right, and, and I kind of figured, like, you know, uh, you, if you think of it as a penalty, like, oh, I have to do this exam now, it's so hard, right, uh, you know, that's, that's not the right mind space to be, you gotta, you gotta feel like, ah, now I get to talk, let me say what I'm gonna say, let me say what I've been thinking about, right, that's how you should feel about this, because it's your opportunity to say, what you're talking about, what you're thinking about, and what you've been thinking about and writing about for all these years. And you get you get to sort of like throw that out there. That's awesome. And that's definitely like perspective I've taken on it too. I think about it like this is my chance to geek out and nerd out, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, again, with, the, with what you told me in mind, like all those years back, I still keep that all the time in my head. Um, so on Facebook, we have a quick comment uh, going back to your uh, Tamale documentary project um this is from winsome brooks and she says we like to sing about what we eat and um <laughs> so that, that was really cool nice and then, yeah um and then denise um is asking have you done much research on uh corridos 
or do you have any interest in corridos as a type of music to analyze? Wow, Denise, thank you. Thank you for that question. So uh, the quick and the short answer is yes, uh, which is why I love the question. Uh, the longer answer to the question is, um, I got this big idea when I was, I think I was finishing my doctoral degree and it was my first year as a professor at Boston College. And I was trying to write a paper on corridos uh, I was trying to, and I think my, my title was, you know, corridos as a form of communication or something it was really simple. And then what happens, and you all know exactly what I'm talking about is when you do the research, um, I started finding people had written about corridos already before me in a lot of different fields, right? Especially music, history, musicology, ethnomusicology. So then I figured, oh, well, I'm not doing anything, you know, that special. And you're not going to believe this, but I found a, a book, a whole book. Uh, that was about corridos as a form of communication by a woman that I had actually known in my master's program before I even went to a doc. So then I was like, okay, I, this has already been done, right? There's a whole book called Corridos as Communication. Uh, so uh, I haven't written about it since then because that was this big moment for me, like, wah, wah, somebody's already been here. They took my big idea and I couldn't write about it. Uh, but to, to be honest with you, I haven't given up on the, on the idea because corridos are still interesting to me. And, you know, 10, 15, 20 years on the other side of this, I would still like to find an angle on corridos as a form of communication. I think the point where I'm at now is like, how do I find an angle that hasn't been done already in terms of hasn't been published already? Uh, but to answer your question, I found a bunch of articles in a whole book and I was like, ah, they took my idea. Right? But that happens in grad school, right? Uh, you, you find an article like, oh, geez, somebody already wrote this. Okay, well, that's okay. But you figure out how you can take it sort of slightly this way or do something a little bit different enough to where it's a contribution. Dr. Ramir, I have a question for you. What's yeah. been your favorite genre of music or genre of film to really like, um, or is there maybe a certain uh, song or a certain uh, film that you were like deeply invested in in your research that this was a really like, passionate project for you? Well, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I can't remember if you and I had these conversations, Anthony, but uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and I was like a heavy metal kid. Uh, all my friends were rockers, right? Heavy metal kids, punks, stoners. That's who I grew up with. And uh, that's the music of my youth, and that's what I identified with, right? Uh, I grew up here in the United States, so the reason I'm saying that is because it was it was all about like heavy metal and punk to me. Um, and so, if you'd have asked me as an 18, 19, 20 year old kid, you know, and even even when I got into college, right, I was I was passionate about popular music because I identified as a metalhead and like a punk kid, you know, both, right? Which is you know, there's a little bit of there's a little bit of overlap, and that that's who I was in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and ironically enough, maybe not ironically. When I got into college level research, right, college papers, both my work as an undergrad, which eventually became like a master's thesis, right? When you're doing that kind of work, you don't find yourself in stories or, or books about popular music or any kind of popular music research because they don't talk about Latinos. They don't talk, especially punk and heavy metal. They don't talk about Latinos or Chicanx or nothing, right? They don't talk about us at all. Uh, so some of the work that I did early on from my, from my graduate student experience to the, my first book, which was published in 2010, which was uh, inserting Latinos, right, Latinx, Mexican-Americans into the conversation about rock music, rock history, what rock music means in terms of identity construction, and right, that's, that's the work that I did, because when I came up, there was nothing there about us, they weren't talking about us, right? So speaking of the Chicano experience and, and Chicano pedagogy, right, I did something which was even more, <laughs> I'm going to say dumb, right, because I was trying to talk about like, you know, Chicano and Latino representation in rock music or heavy metal, you know what I mean? And, and you know, try, try making sense of that in the late 90s or mid 90s, you know what I mean? It just wasn't there. Uh, nobody was talking about that, right? Um, so that's some of the work that I, that I was doing. Uh, to answer your question, Anthony, is, is I've been writing about rock music uh, for, for a good part of my career. I've been sort of articulating rock music and Latinos, Latinx, right? Put, putting us 
into the conversation about rock music and identity and rock music history and all that. Now, the question about film is, is interesting because most recently, I, I think I told you all, uh, I sort of came up as a popular music scholar. And in the past 10 years, I've been transitioning into doing more film studies, but that's just because of my job here at UTEP. I got hired as a, as a popular culture studies professor and they asked me what I teach film classes. Um, so my, my work recently has been more about film and cinema. Um, and so to answer that part of the question, Anthony, is um, I'm, I'm now doing work in, in music as it has appeared in film. Um, and I've been studying the films of uh, the three great Mexican directors uh, Guillermo del Toro, Ale, uh, Alfonso Cuarón, and Alejandro González Iñárritu. I've been studying their work, but specifically I'm writing, I've written two articles now about the music in their films. So I'm studying their films and I'm also studying the music in their films. Uh, one article is about to get published and another article is in the works. I remember that, that you were mentioning that project. We sat in the Chico's Tacos one day and we were having this conversation. Really? Yeah. You remember that? I do. That was awesome. Nice. So, um, I guess one of the final, I guess one of the final questions, because yeah, we're almost uh, out. But um, one, uh, uh, the one, a uh, question that I want to know is, what is some advice that you would give to yourself as a first year master's student and a first year PhD student, a PhD student with all the knowledge that you have now? Ooh, the first year. First year, the question is the first year. Uh, first year master's student, first year PhD student. Um, well, all I can say from my experience, from my memories and people that I've talked to now, everybody that I know, it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard, it's awkward, it's work, it's lonely. You're trying to figure out who you are. You're trying to figure out whether you should be doing this. You're trying to figure out whether you belong there right? Especially if you've gone from one state to another state or one country to another country, right? You're trying to figure out, do I belong here? Should I even be here? What am I doing? Um, all I can say is uh, just keep doing it. Don't give up. Don't quit. Uh, keep doing the work. You will find yourself. And what is, what is especially true about the first year experience is you don't know what you're doing. And you're maybe not 100% sure of yourself. And uh, you're trying to figure it out. And you know what? That's okay. That's okay. You're not supposed to know it all. You're in process as a student, as a scholar, as an adult human. Uh, you're in process. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And I kind of feel like, you know, the world beats us down because we're supposed to have to figure it out. We're supposed to like know what we're doing. You know, we'll, people will beat you down. Uh, because you don't have it all done yet, or you don't have the perfect plan yet. You know, when I was a first year master's student, my mom and dad and my family were telling me, why don't you have a job yet? You know what I mean? And then when I told them I was going to study communication, they're like, what are you going to do with that? You know, what job are you going to get? You know, and imagine that, you know, two or three years later doing a PhD, what job are you going to get? You know, um, it's okay to not know. It's okay to not have it figured out. You're in process, your career's in process, your work as a student is in process, and that's okay. You know, don't stress out about it being done. You're not a done deal yet. Your career's not a done deal yet. Really, you're at the beginning of what hopefully will be a cool, life-changing experience for you, especially professionally and, and personally also, right? But, you know, give yourself permission to not have it figured out the first year, right? Your job is to get good grades, stay, stay in it, do the work, and don't mess it up so that you can come back next year. <laughs> you know what I mean? So nobody hates you or so you don't do something dumb to get kicked out or, you know, whatever. Just stay in it. Keep doing the work. Keep fighting. Uh, be there next year. And then the year after that, do all the right things so you can be there the year after that. Right? Just keep plugging away. Just keep doing the work. You don't need to have it all done yet. You don't need to have it all figured out. Just keep working. Keep working. Awesome. Um, I'd like to know what Denise uh, thinks about this as well. Denise, um, what would you want to say to yourself um, as a first year master's or PhD student, knowing what you know now? Yeah, I think um, three things come to mind. One, um, building and all of them connect with what 
um, Roberto was just talking about, but one of them is be compassionate with yourself. That was one of the, the pieces of advice I received when I was a master's student. I was like, oh, I should be here. And I should, I have all of these ideas and all this work I need to do and it needs to be. And she's like, you're good. Be compassionate with yourself. You are where you are and that's great, right? So that was, that was really um, helpful to just situate myself there because academia can be hostile. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is, is um, I, I have a clipboard where I write little messages for myself that help me remember <laughs> what I want to keep um, focal, like focused on. And one of those things is, um, you know, remember you are like right on track, keep up your pace. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that reminds me of like, my pace doesn't have to be swift. It can go slow and gradual or at mo some moments I'll be really creative and profound. And some moments I just want to sit down and like veg out and watch like reality TV and not care about anything. <laughs> um, and so like part of that is keeping my pace because part of that is also allowing me to decompress and process. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the third thing is, is another like strategic thing. Um, first year, create an annotated bibliography set up thematically or where you are you have a bibliography the annotated bibliography you have all the citations you have like the key argument themes some questions that you're thinking about when you're reading this because all of the work you start off with will eventually be very helpful when you're later down the line and you don't have to reread a, a paper as if you've never read it before look at your annotated bibliography, what have you said about that? And then reread it again, now we're keeping in mind maybe some thoughts that you had previously. The annotated bibliography, I unfortunately discovered the significance of it a little later than I would have liked. But um, yeah, those are three things I can think of. That was wonderful. Um, so with that being said, um, I just wanna thank our guests one more time. Uh, for being on uh, today's uh, lecture series of uh, Showing Trajectory, Los Scholars, Es Scholars, Los Scholars, however you want to say it. But um, uh, thank you so much, Denise Meda Calderon and Dr. Roberto Amir for being our guest today. Um, I'm Anthony Ramirez and uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, we hope to see you in the next uh, Showing Trajectory lecture series. <laughs>